that's loud. I'd like to call to order the meeting of Monday, April the 8th. If you'd like to join me for the Pledge of Allegiance, please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If the clerk would please take the roll. Council Member Archibald? Here. Council Member Ashford? Present. Council Member Haremsa? Here. Council Member Lamb? Here. Council Member Mosrak? Here. Council Member Pemberton? Here. Mayor Here. You have the minutes before you from the regular meeting of March 25th. Is there a motion to receive and file? So move, Madam Chair. Support. It was moved by Council Member Ashford, supported by Mayor Pro Tem Archibald. Is there any changes to the minutes? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes stand as submitted. We do have two presentations tonight. If the clerk will please read the first one. Proclamation recognizing April as Child Abuse Prevention Month will be presented to representatives of the St. Clair County Child Abuse and Neglect Council. I almost hate to get up because Sherry and I Come on, twin. <laughs> wore the same outfit tonight accidentally. <laughs> Would y'all call each other? It's an accident, but hey. No, we didn't buy them together, but we are wearing them together tonight, so here we go. <laughs> Whereas poor Heron's children are our future, whenever one child is abused or neglected, the entire community suffers. And whereas in St. Clair County, 5,390 children were living in poverty, 3,367 children were living in homes investigated for child abuse and neglect, and 476 children were confirmed victims of child abuse and neglect. And whereas child abuse is one of the nation's most serious public health problems, and studies have well documented the link between abuse and neglect and a wide range of medical, emotional, and behavioral disorders, including depression, alcoholism, drug abuse, and juvenile delinquency. And whereas unemployment, poverty, parental drug and alcohol abuse, stress, and social isolation increase the risk for an environment in which child maltreatment can occur. And whereas promoting optimum family functioning resiliency, adequate social support systems, and knowledge of parenting child development all are known protective factors which prevent child maltreatment and help strengthen families. And whereas this month and each month hereafter, the city and county, under the leadership of the St. Clair County Child Abuse and Neglect Council, pledges the strength of our entire community to prevent child abuse and neglect and not to stand by in silence. Now therefore, I, Pauline M. Rep, by the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Port Huron, and on behalf of council members Archibald, Ashford, Haremsa, Lamb, Moserak, and Pemberton, do hereby proclaim April to be Child Abuse Prevention Month in the city of Port Huron. Child abuse prevention is an acknowledged community responsibility and it is our duty to cherish our children and help them grow and develop to their fullest potential. I would like to give this to you. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, Sherry Archibald, when I'm not up there, I am the Executive Director for the St. Clair County Child Abuse and Neglect Council. We provide prevention education to children in every elementary, middle, and high school. And then we also provide advocacy services for the victims and their families, as well as mental health services for all children who disclose abuse in our office through our forensic interviewing process. One in 10 children in the United States suffer from child abuse every 10 seconds. There's a report. Every 10 seconds, that's, that's just an astronomical number. And then one in 10 children suffer abuse, doesn't matter where you go, doesn't matter what your income is, it doesn't matter what your education level is, it doesn't matter, it knows no boundaries. We uh, see people in our office at poverty level and that maybe live up on the lake. It doesn't matter what where you live, it's happening, it's happening in our community. And what we're really doing in April, we raise awareness all year, but we really wanna raise that awareness in April because that is Child Abuse Prevention Month and Child Abuse Awareness Month. If you drive by our office, you will see blue pinwheels out front. The pinwheel replaced the ribbon as the symbol for child abuse uh, because it represents the carefree, happy childhood every child deserves, but yet not every child gets. Quickly, one in four girls and one in six boys will be abused by the age of 18. That's sexually abused. Uh, we, we haven't even added physical abuse into that. Last year, our office interviewed 300 children 
all who reside in St. Clair County. So that's to tell you that isn't everybody that's been abused. It's not everybody that's had a call put in. It's simply the ones that came through our office that we did a forensic interview to determine if the allegations were true and then work with law enforcement, child protective services, and the prosecuting attorney's office to help put the perpetrator away. 300 children is 100 more than we saw the year before. Wow. We like to believe that's because we're out there raising awareness every day, trying to get people to understand how to recognize the signs of child abuse and how to make a report of child abuse so that we can help put a stop to it. We're not gonna stand before you and say that we think we can stop child abuse 100%. We know that's, we, we can't eradicate poverty. We're not gonna eradicate that either. Our, what our goal is to prevent it as much as possible. And when we can't prevent it, to stop it and to provide services to those children to help them heal so that they, go, they can grow up, either enjoy the rest of their childhood, but also grow up and live a very happy and productive life as an adult. So that is our goal. I thank you for your time. Uh, we hope that everyone in our community will visit our website and uh, talk to each other and raise awareness along with us. But above all else, if you see something, say something. Make that phone call, make that report, and help us to protect the children of our community. Thank you. Thank you. We have another presentation, if you agree. Number two, please. Chief Joseph Platzer will present the annual police department report. Chief Platzer. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council, and City Manager. Uh, so I'd like to pr present the 2023 annual report. I did provide you all with a copy. And for the citizens of Port Huron, or St. Clair County, they can go on the website, www.porthuronpolice.org, and it's also there for viewing. So we'll start off with, uh, we had several new hires last year. We hired four officers, Officer Max Field, uh, O'Neill, Snay, and Janella. Um, I'm proud to report that Officer O'Neill, Snay, and Janella just completed their FTO process and they're recently um, out on the road solo patrol. Matter of fact, Officer Snay, uh, her first night solo patrol is this evening. Uh, we hired five cadets and uh, we currently have two cadets that are in the police academy Cadet Grifka and uh, Cadet Kellerman. Um, they're slated to graduate in May. And uh, if everything goes as planned, they'll graduate end of May and then they'll start their FTO period and then they'll be ready for solo patrol in September of this year. After 26 uh, dedicated years of service to the Port Huron Police Department in the city of Port Huron, Lieutenant Chris Frazier retired and uh, he has now been replaced by Lieutenant James Gilbert who oversees the criminal investigative division. With that, we created some promotions. Sergeant Pat East was promoted to lieutenant. Detective Adriana Meinsberg was promoted to sergeant and Officer Travis Reed to detective. Further in the year, Sergeant uh, Ryan Sheedy was promoted to lieutenant and Officer uh, Jennifer Sly uh, was promoted to sergeant. And she's one of our canine officers and she'll actually be giving up the canine within the next month and we'll be uh, looking for a new canine officer. So that will be exciting for the department. Statistics, uh, we had a decrease in our calls for service. We're down approximately a little over 2,300. Uh, but I uh, look at that is during this time period, we were down several officers for injuries and for hiring. And uh, as you will see, we have a reduction in crime across the board uh, for 2023. Crime reports, 5% uh, decrease. Open reports, 16.3% uh, uh, decrease. And with that, that means our officers are closing more reports and they're sending them more to the prosecutor's office for review and for uh, prosecution. Reports sent to the uh, prosecutor, again, we show a 7.1% increase. Reports going across the street for the uh, prosecutor to review for uh, issuance of warrants or for uh, prosecution. Vehicle pursuits in the city uh, went down uh, by so, over 7%. We actually went from 13 to 12, which is a good thing. Uh, our supervisors, 
uh, whenever we have a pursuit in the city are monitoring it um, and uh, they will make a decision whether the pursuit continues or not and our officers actually do a really good job on um, calling off a lot of the pursuits themselves subject control um, there's two different uh, numbers that I have up here last year we arrested 1,682 people um, in the year 2023 of that 154 we had to use subject control and what that is is when somebody resists or when somebody pulls away or we have to go beyond mere handcuffing we do a subject control report to document that it could be a display of a taser they could be a display of a firearm uh, it's the fact that we have to muscle somebody's arms behind their back um, OC spray so out of over 1600 arrests we only had to use uh, subject control 154 times if you look at the next slide that shows that under the influence of alcohol is, uh, is 40 of those but mental uh, subject subject suspected of mental illness is 47 so we're dealing with a lot more people with mental illness in the city of Fort Huron. Criminal sexual conduct we saw a 9.3 percent increase um, in this uh, area so there are several things uh, that we looked at uh, war crimes um, are being reported uh, due to education and the decreased st uh, stigma in reporting sex crimes we had more crimes reported to us through child protective services and then victims interviewed uh, by investigators and our forensic interviews with our partnership with the trial uh, child advocacy center led to additional crimes during this uh, this increase we had two uh, homicides in the city of uh, Fort Huron auto theft uh, showed a 19.5 uh, decrease arsons was down larcenies was down home invasions were down malicious destruction of property was down robberies 25% uh, decrease charts um, domestics we saw a decrease of 11 percent reported overdoses results uh, to more um, we're happy to report that overdoses were down 46 percent in the city last year and with that uh, it's our partnership with Odyssey uh, by setting up the uh, Narcan you can get it readily available here or other locations and uh, with that unfortunately uh, we saw three overdose deaths but that's down from 12 in 2022 so we're seeing an increase with it going in the right direction and of those 51 uh, overdose survivors uh, more was able to find or make contact with 25 of those uh, victims and provide them services also mental health calls we saw a 2.8 percent decrease um, and we uh, implemented a law enforcement embedded uh, licensed professional counselor uh, who works with Officer Baker in our crime analysis. And they go up and follow up on these mental health uh, calls for service. Um, April of 2023, uh, that's when she started. So we only have nine months of data so far. And of those nine months, uh, she's responded to 723 total mental health calls and she was able to provide uh, 391 individuals uh, with services so a uh, huge uh, benefit to our department accidents uh, were down fatal accidents we had uh, five in 2022 and zero in 2023 a drastic increase uh, injury accidents were down operating under the influence we saw an increase and I uh, attribute that to our officers being more proactive when it comes to uh, people out, uh, driving under the influence of alcohol and drugs violations uh, decrease uh, parking violations we saw an increase something that I brought to council uh, several years ago with Captain Young was our flock cameras and you can see the successes here uh, recovery of vehicles wanted subjects 
Uh, one of the big ones that we had in 2023 was January 10th. A four-year-old was um, kidnapped or abducted by her father in Marysville. And with the help of the flat cameras, starting in Michigan all the way to Ohio, um, she was rescued in Lima, Ohio, and was uh, reunited, reunited with her mother. Mm -hmm. So this is a huge success story for the uh, flat camera system. Kalia, I'm proud to report that uh, both through state accreditation and through our national accreditation, uh, we received reaccreditation in uh, February and in March of this year. Um, to be accredited, it means that the department has voluntarily undergone a rigorous review process and has met or exceeded a set of professional standards designed to enhance our capabilities to prevent and control crime, increase agency effectiveness and efficiency in the delivery of law enforcement services. So what does that mean to the community? Uh, PHPD holds their accreditations and can ensure reassurance that the Portland Police Department is dedicated to maintaining the highest standard of uh, professional law enforcement and is willing to make uh, or willing to measure and be accountable to state and nationally recognized benchmarks for excellence. So in closing, you can review that and you can contact me if you have any further questions. But I want to thank the uh, hardworking men and women of the Oregon Police Department that every day go out and do their job with uh, dignity, uh, honor, and uh, they're providing the best service to the citizens, community, and the department. And I want to thank all of you for your continuous support of myself and the uh, department. So thank you. Thank you, Chief. For, thank you, Chief, for all that you do and your department and great report. Is there anyone on council that has any questions for the chief? I just have a couple, may wrap up, if I may? Yes. Um, chief, two things. Uh, the flock results, can you kind of elaborate <coughs> on flock with that, what that's all about? So that's our LPR, license plate reader license. system. Mm -hmm. And it's not only in the city of Port Huron now, but it's through St. Clair County, mm -hmm. um, other agencies. And it allows us to put vehicle information in and it allows us to uh, help us assist. Excuse me, my mouth is dry. It's okay. <laughs> Do you want some water? <laughs> um, it allows us to assist by uh, doing investigations. Mm -hmm. and it allows us to help locate vehicles. We're not out taking pictures of, of people. It's just capturing license plate and the data and allows us to uh, assist with the investigation and our officers to locate vehicles that are involved in crimes. Oh, okay, I remember when we, you brought it to us, it was a whole lot of, it's a big pushback with that. And so I just wanted you to kind of, you know, emphasize a little At bit At first, more. We had some negative comments, yeah. but uh, I will tell you that the success stories have outweighed anything that's uh, been negative about it. Yeah, turned out to be absolutely good. And then yes. also with the Kalia accreditation, uh, as part of that process, I think uh, you should mention that the public does have a say so in that also, is that correct? That's correct. Um, while the um, accreditors was at the police department, Mm -hmm. uh, we did have telephone phone-ins, we had uh, comments on our social media sites, and people were allowed to uh, give their comments, both positive and negative, and okay. we received both. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mira. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Well, as I said, great report and great job, you and your department. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to public comment. If there's anyone in the audience who wishes to address the council, please come forward. Just give us your name and address, and you have four minutes. Yes, good afternoon, council members, city manager, mayor, Ken Harris, 1521 Wells Street, Port Yarn. Uh, first, I want to apologize that I'm kind of, it's been a tough winter and stuff for the Harrises, but, but anyways, I, I kind of missed the early uh, comments or the period for CDG grant money and stuff where it went some of the issues that I want to take up about the plan and stuff is uh, we don't have a walkable plan with the, with the, uh, uh, these, these benefits and stuff this year. You know, I know that we've kind of gone the other way with, the, with our monies for uh, sidewalks and stuff, 
but I'd like to see somehow or another get at that, get that money back for sidewalks. But the other thing, the other one issue is only $12,000 for neighborhood cleanup. Uh, I think it's worked, it worked, it's worked good when we've had it in the Harrison neighborhood, and I, I think it's unfortunate that we're only going to do $12,000 because that's probably only two neighborhoods or two precincts in the city. Uh, the other thing is, is, is when we get back to the sidewalk issue, is, is I guess my question was, is broadband worth, worth the, uh, worth the, uh, is broadband worth, worth, sidewalks, worth more than sidewalks? It kind of just jogged me. I understand, you know, with it's just modern world stuff and broadband's important, but I think our sidewalks are more important. And I, the other thing that really griped me with the report, with you know, they they used to I show the areas of where the low income and the minor minorities live and stuff like that because this is what the CDB funds is for the, the low income people, the minorities, and stuff like that. And uh, basically, it says that they can't, low, they, can, they there's no low income or minority areas. You know, I use a little bird reverse psychology. And I said, well, if we can't find where they live, we can find out where they don't live. And you could just take a look at Edison Shores, the towers down here, Colonial Woods, Sherwin Woods, and Riverside Drive. I mean, you know, it, here you go. It's, it's, it's a perfect place to find. You can eliminate these areas already because you know the people that live there make a, uh, quite a bit more money. The other thing I'd like to speak about is, is resolution number four. I, I, I sound this idea is about neighborhood uh, 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 clubs and stuff like that or, or organizations. And what are we going to do if we have that? We're promoting this program now, and if we have two entities that would like to be to be to have their neighborhood as a watch program, you know, and I, and I think we have to find out how we're going to resolve that issue and have it's going to happen. I mean, somebody might be happy on the west side, or somebody might be happy on the south side, and, and they're going to compete with Mr. Bixler or somebody else for that that that, that territory. And I think this is an issue that should be discussed before we go out and assign property to other people. Uh, last thing, uh, not last thing, but not, resolution number five, change the meeting time. I think the idea of changing the meeting time to 6 p.m. will, will disenfranchise the, the city citizens of Port Yard and, and its residents. I just think it's, it's kind of a step backwards. I, I like 7 o'clock. I never had a problem with it. When I wasn't on council, I followed council, and it's, it's seven o'clock is a perfect time for me, and evidently it's a good time for residents. Um, and while we're here, I just let me talk one more little bit here. I talked to James just prior to the meeting here, and we have some people up here that said they they probably be interested to to find out too. But in, on resolution number seven, which is a consent item, it talks about 15 streets that are being decertified. With, before you touch in, I, I would hope that you would explain to some of the other people because we have people that are here that live on Barney Street and, and I'm sure that there's other people associated with we've got 15 streets that we're going to and I just want to make some some assurance they're going to get the same services as everybody else thank you thank you is there anyone else who wishes to address the council this evening Hi, my name is Kirk Kramer, 4100 Stony Creek Drive, Fort Gratiot, and president of SC4. And I'm here tonight to thank you. SC4 has been serving residents of the area for over 100 years, and the campus of the college is in the city of Port Huron and has been for over 100 years. Our campus, our existence is closely intertwined with the city and is part of the fabric of making Port Huron a great place to be. Thank you for the generations of hosting a community college in the city. Thank you to James Freed for an open and honest collaboration with the college to realize the benefits of a community college in the city. Thank you to Chief Platzer for the joint agreement the college has for a campus resource officer and for always being a support and help to the college. And thank you to everyone at the city as we always receive uh, encouragement and, and uh, information and a follow-up as we need. Every encounter that we have with the city is uh, well received and working well with the city. Thank you. Well, thank you to you too for being here in the city of Port Heron. A little further informa information, 
There are approximately 275 cities in the state of Michigan. There are 28 community colleges in Michigan, and not all are located within a city jurisdiction. So Port Huron is one of the few of all cities in Michigan with a community college. SC4 in Port Huron is one of only 11 community colleges with housing for students and the only community college in Southeast Michigan with housing for students. Those are students living in downtown Port Huron. Studies show students with education and training after high school earn more over a lifetime. So your hosting of a community college provides a difference in lives in our area. SC4 provides education and culture for all residents through concerts, arts, speakers, and educational events on campus. One example is our recent STEM Fest, which had over 5,000 attendees for a day of celebration of science and to learn of the expertise in science that's here every day, science located in our faculty, in our courses, and in our permanent exhibits on science, hands-on science, on our campus. We collaborated with that event with Michigan Tech University, which goes across the country with exhibits on science. And we were one of only three events in Michigan by Michigan Tech University from fall 23 through spring of 24. So our city, one of three in the entire state hosting Michigan Tech traveling science exhibit for our STEM Fest. More high school graduates go to SC4 than the state average of high school graduates going to a community college. SC4 is a benefit to the community because of the community. Our success is your success. April is recognized as Community College Month. So thank you for hearing my thoughts on SC4, especially during this month of national, state, and local recognition of the value of community colleges. But most importantly, thank you for your work. We look forward to building toward our 200th year anniversary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to address the city council this evening? <clears throat> Good evening, council members. My name is Craig Kloss. I'm from 3874 Logan Drive. Uh, I come tonight with a couple questions regarding uh, the dam project. Uh, first off, I'd like to know how do I obtain a copy of the engineering assessment that was conducted? Uh, two, if you could share um, how the bidding process was done. Have you secured bids? Um, did you send out RFQs? You know, how was that done? If you could possibly uh, provide an update. Do you have a timeline, um, kind of an update where we are, where we stand, where you think the timing might be for the dam? You can request information through the Freedom of Information Act as far as details. Um, I th at the end of the meeting, we can um, give an update on okay. it. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the city council this evening? Um, Kathleen McCready, 414 14th Street, Port Huron. Regarding resolution 24-038, um, the Neighborhood Association. It's been a long time in coming and I'm really grateful that somebody finally recognized this and is willing to carry forward and allow neighborhoods, individuals to identify and it's been We've always waxed and waned in Harrison Point, but as I said, you know, six or nine months ago, you can Google Harrison Point if you're looking for a house and zero in on our neighborhood. Um, we do have a lot of pluses. The identity is, is a plus, and I'm grateful to, well, I guess nobody's here from the planning department tonight, but I would assume that's where it came from. If it didn't, yeah, it I didn't did. want to step on anybody's toes, but it <laughs> thank you. And um, I do have a form in my purse that I filled out to update 
our parameters because it did say in your paperwork that um, you can refer to the neighborhood map, which I did, and Sherman Woods and so on and so forth, different neighborhoods were on there. But we were on there with our parameters, although it was from 2012. So <laughs> things have changed a little bit over the years, but we're still active and we're still in communication with our neighborhood. And I think this is a huge plus and I hope it has success moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the city council this evening? Please come forward. Good evening. Curtis Carroll, Portion Township. Uh, Chief Platzer's presentation, very impressive, makes everything look great. City, as we know, the two murders uh, we had in the city, uh, Casey and Josh. The one category he left out is uh, when you're arresting a subject that's unresponsive. He did not touch on that at all. Uh, just curious if any of you guys have reached out to the Attorney General's office on the status of the investigation and the charges and anything that's pending. If you did, maybe you guys could enlighten us, but you may have not. Um, liquor license at the Roach, sounds like that's getting renewed. You guys had an opportunity to, opportunity to object to that. Nobody did. Want to make the city a better place, you got to step it up a notch. Um, Andy's wine bar, he uh, purchased that property. I feel it's pretty ballsy after walking in this building today. The wind was not favorable for me to breathe the air coming in here. Poop palace needs to be addressed. The odor control system that was a major failure needs to be addressed. We need to take that up and make that a priority. We're heading into the summer months. People want to enjoy your city. It's hard to do with that, with that bunk. Um, just do better. And if you can't, then let's get some new people in here. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the City Council this evening? Holden Gothier, 11th Ave. Um, in regards to uh, Chief Platzer's report, just a few things that jumped out to me. Statistics-wise, the vehicle pursuit and crime rates went down as far as crime reported. But that's um, in relation to the prior years, which were highs, and just looking at the data sets that were really briefly up there, we really flew through that. Uh, we decreased from the highs, but it still looked like we were higher than the previous four years when you do exclude 2022. So it does look like there's perhaps more work to be done there. Uh, as far as the annual action plan goes, which I unfortunately did not get to touch much on uh, last meeting, on page 37, um, there's a new subdivision that's also under development in the city which will be the first one in decades. The hope is that the creation of new housing will lead to renters purchasing homes and freeing up affordable rental units for other people. I have a pretty substantial concern um, with the language of that, which is, um, I'm assuming you're talking about the McNeil Creek development. I'm close to there and I've become quite intimate with the area and it implies that these low-income renters will move out into perhaps newly created housing. But these condos, they are, they are detached condos, they've been listing between a quarter million dollars to $300,000. Between the sticker price of these new homes and the current interest rates, Port Huron is hardly achieving the goal of freeing up affordable units. And with the code in this city, it limits, the limits are specifying the sizes of lots, mandating garages, and establishing minimum home sizes these condos are just juxtaposed in the environment. All those houses in the area, a lot of them are under 800 square foot on substantially smaller lots. They really don't fit in for that area. There's a step when you're moving from affordable renting to affordable owning, and that step simply is not moving into a quarter million dollar condo. To free up those affordable units, what if we return to the roots of that Garfield and Sanborn Park area and create genuine starter homes, which will sort of set that bar and let people move into more affordable housing. 
And then in regards to the water rates, which I did touch on before, I would just like to reiterate that for a citizen here, if you use zero gallons of water, you just left your, your connection on and you just paid the flat fees, you would pay $763 over the course of a year, which is still less or still more than a Fort Gratiot resident that consumes 42,000 gallons of water, which their bill would be $580. Notably for larger businesses like Mueller Brass, which is a principal customer of Port Huron, they would pay more if they moved out of the city. A lot of these flat rates are incentivizing more usage because the rate is low, but the flat rate is high. And ultimately that's imposing substantial costs on citizens rather than higher users, higher level users in this city. And I really can't find what these RTS fees are going to. Cities like Grand Rapids have a 200 page rate analysis that they publish and show everybody in the city that's paying these water bills how much they're paying in relation to other municipalities that Grand Rapids services. And I've spent weeks researching this, and as far as what James Fried said, you had told me that there's a comparative analysis you could provide. I've reached out twice. I did not receive that. So I've moved on to FOIAing that because of your lack of response, as well as Conrad Haremza, which was on that email, because I assumed you were sending it to him, as you had said. And yeah, that's, um, that's kind of it for now. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the city council this evening? Uh, Mark Sanderson, Fort Gratiot. Um, I just uh, you know, talked about Chief Latcher's talking about the flock cameras and how they found that girl. Uh, that was kidnapped. I'm just curious, like the city has two portable cameras. And on November 4th, I see the camera still sitting there in the same spot when Joshua Conant was murdered. And the camera wasn't working the night he was murdered. I'm just curious, is the camera working now? Because I do know our investigators FOIA'd, want to FOIA'd the footage. And he was, they were told that uh, there was a glitch in the camera that night. So I'm just curious, does it work now or is it just there for looks? I Can don't. anybody, anybody? I mean, I it's the city's. Well, we'll answer it later, okay? Because we don't do back and forth during public audience with so questions. The so the next council answer. meeting, I'll have an answer on that then? Yes, you will. What did you guys, um, for the issue on November 4th, did they figure out what was wrong with the glitch? What was that, I'm sorry? Well, the camera wasn't working November 4th of Correct. 2023. Did, is, did you guys figure out what was wrong with it that night? Why it didn't work? I'll also find that out for you. Okay. Do I have to FOIA that or will you guys just give that? No, you don't have to FOIA it. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the council this evening? Seeing no one, I will declare public comment closed. <clears throat> we'll move on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. Support. Mayor, just one moment, Mayor Pro Tem Archibald, supported by Councilmember Mosrak. Yes, Councilmember Ashford. The light number seven removed off. We had in listening public hearing. We had someone question that. Number seven. Number seven. On resolutions. Okay. We'll take the vote. Councilmember Archibald. Yes. Councilmember Ashford. Yes. Council Member Horenza? Yes. Council Member Lamb? Yes. Council Member Mosierak? Yes. Council Member Pemberton? Yes. Mayor Rapp? Yes. The items on the consent agenda received and filed a copy of the completed 2024 assessment roll. Authorizes submission of a special liquor license application to the Michigan Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs Liquor Control Commission for the city of Port Huron's Rocking the Lake event on Wednesday evenings during the month of July at Lakeside Park and recommending the license be issued. Recognizing April 26, 2024 as Arbor Day in the city of Port Huron and confirming the mayor's reappointment of Lee Ward to the Brownfield Redevelopment Authority with a term to expire April 14, 2027. And we will go to, from the city manager, item one. Accepting the bid from ASAG and All Paving Company 
in the amount of $1,705,560.15 for the Francis and Taylor Street area resurfacing project. Is there a motion? So move. Support. Council Member Ashford, supported by Council Member Lamb. Mr. Freed, would you like to elaborate on this one? Yeah, this is a the mill and fill projects to keep those roads in good condition. I do want to say this is about 4.5 miles of roadway. We have consistently been doing this every single year for the last couple of years now, um, trying to go. We started out in the middle section of the city, also in the, in the south end of the city, where the sewer separation project originally began in the 90s. Um, I think this is important to note because this is the street millage funds being used to fund these repairs. The street millage renewal is up in May, um, and this is what this money goes to, is to make sure the roads are good, make sure that money goes right to asphalt in the neighborhoods. And this was a part of PASER? Yes. Also? Okay. Yep. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Free? We will take the vote. Council Member Ashford? Yes. Council Member Haremza? Yes. Council Member Lamb? Yes. Council Member Mosierak? Yes. Council Member Pemberton? Yes. Council Member Archibald? Yes. Mayor Rep? Yes. Item two. Accepting the bid from Wolverine Freightliner Eastside Incorporated in the amount of $106,572 for the purchase of a 2025 model year chassis and approving the bid from Schultz Equipment LLC in the amount of $142,989 for the purchase and installation of a stainless steel dump body, salt spreader, and underbody plow for use by the streets division. Is there a motion? So moved. Support. Mayor Pro Tem Archibald, supported by Council Member Lamb. Um, Mr. Freed, do you want to, ex I assume that we're doing this uh, so that we're saving some money. Uh, yes, um, <laughs> this was a budgeted item. Uh, we had budgeted for the combined purchase of the, the, the chassis and the actual outfit in the vehicle to be around $360,000, $180,000 each. So it came in at $249,000, so it was $110,000 under what we estimated it would be. So pricing does seem to stabilize on this equipment. And these are for the big plow trucks on the road, you see? The big orange ones. The, the big plow trucks. Yep. And when was the last time we bought a plow truck? We've been trying to buy one every couple of years to, re to rotate the fleet. So we bought one, I think, three years ago. This will be another one, and then we'll probably buy one in a year or so for, to, just as they age out. Okay. Can't afford to buy them all in one year. No, so gotta rotate absolutely them. not. Any questions from council? No questions, Mayor Rep. But also, to add to you saving money, um, it does uh, seem like this is like multi-usage. It's not just specifically for one department. Correct. We're able to use it all throughout, and it also indicates that this is the kind of tools we would provide for our workforce to do and continue doing a better job at what they're doing. Yes, correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? We'll take them up. Council Member Haremza? Yes. Council Member Lamb? Yes. Council Member Mosierak? Yes. Council Member Pemberton? Yes. Council Member Archibald? Yes. Council Member Ashford? Yes. Mayor Rep? Yes. Um, both items three and four have to do with the 16th Street Park. Is there a problem with taking those together? No problem over here. Okay. Because okay. we can have them discussed at the same time. That's okay. Go ahead. Accepting the bid from Goddard Coatings Company in the amount of $16,425 for the repair, resurface, and restriping of one existing basketball court at 16th Street Park and accepting the proposal from D&E Landscaping and Grading Incorporated in the amount of $44,990 for the design and construction of a nature adventure trail at 16th Street Park. Is there a motion? So moved. Support. Mayor Pro Tem Archibald, supported by Councilmember Mosierak. I see that Oh, she's was. already up there. Oh, she she I was going to yeah. say, I'm looking yes. up there because that's very fast. I did not see you come up there. Sorry. <laughs> you snuck up there. <laughs> um, Mayor at the City Council, um, we're doing, this is part of the half a million dollars that we got through the DNR SPARC grant program. The cool thing about this project is it's actually just won an award, actually, because um, it's going to be the first free play park and actually anywhere, but it, what, it, what, what it'll be geared toward is right now, four and 10 kids 
play on sports teams at school. And we all concentrate on fields for those kids, four and 10 kids, but six and 10 kids don't make the school team, don't have the money to play on a school team. This park will now be geared towards that. We're gonna have a smaller bit of football field, so it's not just for teams, it's just for free play. Same with the wiffle ball field that's already there. You see that in this one that the basketball court's being redone. There's going to be a walking, biking tra track in the back, 40-yard dash, um, some soccer, which we'll have, use in cooperation with the AYSO on that. But just kind of a full-service park of all different activities. I think we're going to do a challenge course there as well. So you'll be seeing some different pieces of this project, but this is in cooperation with the uh, – Michigan DNR Spark Fund. So we're very excited. And and Stebbins. Um, the Stebbins Family Fund also donated money to this project. Oh, so how is the uh, wiffle ball doing? Good. Um, Good. Yes. I think you'll see more activity too. But when, well, once the weather yeah, breaks. Yeah, but it's really, if you ever get a chance and you're bored like me on a Sunday, drive by <laughs> and you'll see, like, it's really cool because, you know, you see kids and grandma and grandpas and kids that you wouldn't normally be seeing playing sports out there playing and I think that's the coolest part about it you don't need a lot of equipment you don't have to be a superstar you just are gonna play and that's what we're hoping this uh, project will bring so um, super excited about this one so we'll see how it goes we expect all of you to be playing <laughs> <this year. laughs> when is it going to be done What's the um, this will be done in pieces we're hoping to have it done by most pieces done by this fall I don't want to promise it's hard to get you know we've been bidding out pieces of it to make it affordable so hopefully by this fall anyone have any questions mayor Rupp, not a question i just want to say thank you nancy for your continued vision uh not only in, it's not one park you're always constantly looking at all of the parks going out and getting the grants grants are hard to get but they're even harder if you don't have a vision that can be supported so thank you for that Thank you, and thank you to Kim. I know we always, but without her, I always say she's the yin my yang because I'm the crazy <laughs> mind person, and she's the uh, great great per person with grants. So super thankful for her as well. Any other questions? And Benjamin Ben Paya. I'd like to no mention. question, but uh, just an observation. Um, yeah, Nancy, it is great because you know we always say that in the town. I think it's a great enhancement and improvement and also love the way that you, the brushes are going down to make it more inviting and more safety, safe-wise there. So, you know, we can never go wrong when we invest in kids and trying to give them something else to do and to use as far as, you know, their discipline and growing up and everything. So thank you and your department. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks for your support. Anything else from anyone? Thanks, Nancy. Thank you. We'll take the vote. Council Member Lamb? Yes. Council Member Mosierak? Yes. Council Member Pemberton? Yes. Council Member Archibald? Yes. Council Member Ashford? Yes. Council Member Haremza? Yes. Mayor Rep? Yes. Resolutions number one. Authorizing 19 payments. Is there a motion? So moved. Support. Council Member Pemberton, supported by Mayor Pro Tem Archibald. Is there any questions on any of the payments? We will take the vote. Council Member Mosierak? Yes. Council Member Pemberton? Yes. Council Member Archibald? Yes. Council Member Ashford? Yes. Council Member Haremza? Yes. Council Member Lamb? Yes. Mayor Rep? Yes. Item two. Authorizing and approving the submission of the annual action plan for program year 2024 to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for their review and approval. Is there a motion? So move. Council Member Ashford, is there a second? Support. Council Member Pemberton. Well, Mr. Freed, I understand that no one's here from staff. Yes, they decided to chase so. the sun today to the totality. What's it called, Bob? The the path of totality. Path of totality, thank you. <laughs> uh, so they are not here. But they did provide me some talking points. First and foremost, I want to address some of the public comments. Uh, the sidewalks are actually being funded. As we stated in the previous meetings, we've added the sidewalks for eligible repairs of the exterior housing rehabilitation. We discovered that because of Davis-Bacon and environmental rules with the feds, that it's cheaper to actually fund the homeowners 
getting their sidewalks fixed themselves, we can get more sidewalks and more linear footage done um, in a single year. The uh, exterior housing rehabilitation is the most uh, successful program we have. We exhaust those funds every year. That helps people paint, get a roof, fix up their home, fix up their sidewalks. That fund works hand in hand with our code enforcement department. So if you have an elderly person who has chipping paint and they can't afford paint, it doesn't make sense that we issue them a ticket. It's better off and it behooves the city's citizens to find a solution to, for them. Neighborhood cleanups, we do two a year. Currently we have one planned for May 18th for the neighborhood between 6th and 10th Street in Oak and Jones, uh, Johnstone Street. We're looking for suggestions for other neighborhoods. So if you are interested in neighborhood cleanup, contact the CDBG office, Jasmine or Joy, and they will put you on the list for a neighborhood cleanup. These estimates are based on uh, 2023 allocation estimates. We will see final re awards in the coming weeks. Of course, that depends. It takes an act of Congress, and so we have Congress to finalize the budget. And I know many of you have emailed Jasmine questions directly and David questions directly, so I just want to give a synopsis. Okay. Yeah, I do have some uh, follow-up yeah. Dave and Jasmine. Is there any question? Are you were you finished with your? Yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Well, I wasn't sure you just sort of, yeah. Okay. Is there anyone in council that has any questions for Mr. Freed? We'll wait for the real call. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. Yeah. Uh, then we will take the vote. Council Member Pemberton? Yes. Council Member Archibald? Yes. Council Member Ashford? Yes. Council Member Haremza? Yes. Council Member Lamb? Yes. Council Member Mosrak? Yes. Mayor Rep. Yes. Item three. Approving the agreement with the Port Huron Area School District for the paving of the city pool parking lot, which is located adjacent to Port Huron High School. Is there a motion? So moved. Support. Council Member Mosrak, supported by Council Member Lamb. Madam Mayor and Council, uh, this has been something that we've been wanting to get done for a while, I believe. Mr. Harris has brought it up a couple times, the condition of the Port Street parking lot. It was very expensive to do on our own, and so we worked with Port Huron Schools. They were going to do a large asphalt project from Port Huron High School, and so it just made sense to us to tie onto their bid because they're buying such a large quantity of voids mobilization fees. So this is our cheapest option, partnering with the school. So as Port Huron High School parking lot, there's going to be some asphalt areas by the fields also getting done. This parking lot will be uh, milled down and resurfaced as well. Very good. Yeah. And the questions, comments? One. Yes. Just one question. Please, Are we looking at the list. summer will be done? I'm hoping it's going to be done before the summer. Okay. Thanks. We will take the vote. Council Member Archibald? Yes. Council Member Ashford? Yes. Council Member Haremza? Yes. Council Member Lamb? Yes. Council Member Mojarek? Yes. Council Member Pemberton? Yes. Mayor Rep. Yes, item four. Madam Mayor, before we go on, I just want to, I forgot that we missed. I do want to thank Theo from the schools. Uh, we talk about having a good relationship with our partners. He cold called me and said, hey, uh, we're doing this project. You want to jump on? Having those relationships are really beneficial when we can just reach out to whether it's Kirk or whether it's Theo uh, to really find areas of savings. So thank you to Theo for being proactive and reaching out. Very good. Yeah, here, yeah, and that's atypical about us. We can't say that about Port Huron. We find some way to collaborate and to get in there and help one another out and make things a lot, whether it's money-wise or just make things better for us as a city. Yeah. It's very so important. Um, yeah, yes. very important. Okay, number four. Approving the City of Port Huron Neighborhood Association and Sign Program. Is there a motion? So move. Councilmember Ashford, is there a second? Support. Councilmember Pemberton, Mr. Freed. Madam Mayor and Council, this was a goal of the Mayor and Council at your goal setting session. Um, we have replaced signs, whether it's Harrison Point, or the Riverwood neighborhood, or Northern Woods, and we really have no formal policy. And so we were tasked uh, with looking around the country at other communities, what they are doing. So what you have here is actually kind of standard what's done across the country and other municipalities if you want to, to get a neighborhood sign. And a lot of people do like to, to name their neighborhood and, and formalize the branding of their neighborhood. Uh, and so this is a written draft policy. Uh, we think it's pretty good. We, we, looked, we, we did send it to legal counsel as well. Uh, Gary Fletcher took a look at it as well and then recommended making sure we tie it with the, uh, with the uh, neighborhood watch programs as well. So we really do want our neighborhoods to become organized, not just to get a free sign and to identify themselves, but there's a lot of benefits to having 
good communications with the neighborhoods to build that communication, to build that trust. So I think this is much broader than just a sign policy. It's a vehicle that allows us to continue building relationships with the homeowners. I agree. Questions, comments? Yeah, just a comment. You know, the first one, I saw, you know, we did talk about it. I had to remember, I had to go back in my notes that uh, we were really all run whole about having the sign program. So you were right about that. But I just want the residents to know that it's not the signs that are going to make the neighborhood. It's the people that's going to make the difference. And you have to keep us accountable as to what we have to serve in that space that you have. You can put up all the signs in the world, but the signs don't make a neighborhood. The people make the neighborhood. So well, I there just, is you know, I was just hung out on that, you know, because we got signs everywhere I look. I have this a sign. I might have to have a sign where I live at, or whatever. But, but that is really important. So get that. You can have these signs, but what energize that sign or make it is that's where you live. You like where you live. That's yours, and it may even call cause you to, you know, keep us in check up here. You know, I, McCree, uh, Ms. McCree said it best, you know, if how you were energized within your neighborhood and how you did things. And I know a lot of other neighborhoods have done that throughout the years, so it's nothing new. It just was no sign there. But people want to know that, you know, the city got the year back. Well, I think it uh, warrants noting that it's not just a matter of uh, somebody requesting a sign and putting it up, it, it, they do have to have a neighborhood organization with officers, meetings, et cetera, and, and partake in the neighborhood watch and, and do all kinds of things that are important to making the neighborhood, as you said, with the people, not just the yeah. sign. So we will move on to number five. I'll take the oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, please do. <laughs> Council member Ashford. Yes. Council Member Haremza? Yes. Council Member Lamb? Yes. Council Member Mosierak? Yes. Council Member Pemberton? Yes. Council Member Archibald? Yes. Mayor Rep? Yes. Now you can move on to item five. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. It's okay. It's all right. First reading approving an amendment to the City Council's Rules of Procedures, Rule 3A, regular meetings, to change the beginning time of regular meetings to 6 p.m. Note that this resolution does require council to postpone final consideration until the next meeting or such other time determined by council. Is there a motion? So moved. Support. Wow. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Archibald, supported by Councilmember Mosrak. And obviously that's nothing you can address, Mr. Free, because it was something that I actually brought up because I had talked to uh, uh, the council and asked them if, if somebody mentioned that they thought it would be better if we did a six o'clock meeting only because uh, a lot of times the lapse of time between when you get out of work and when you go, it's just easier to go from work to the meeting and basically we do not want to prohibit anybody in the public from coming to the meeting so you certainly wouldn't want it any earlier than six o'clock. That being said, the county holds their meetings at six. A lot of the communities around us hold them at six o'clock. This is not unusual. So um, certainly it's entirely up to council whether they want to do that or not and follow through on it. So. I'll leave it open to anybody else to make any comments. Mayor Rep, I just want to add that uh, after this one out, I did get some feedback uh, from from multiple people about make it, it would make it easier for them. I'm sure it'll make it harder for others, so we have to take that into consideration. Uh, but the other piece that I take into consideration is how long we leave the building open at night, and we're paying extra staff to be here until we leave, so moving it up that hour also helps that as well. Uh, so for that reason, uh, I, I do agree. I, I think it'll be a little easier for everyone and it fits within what most of the people in our community or county are doing. So I support it. Mayor Webb. Yes, Councilmember Pemberton. I only want to comment just because it was brought up during public comment by Mr. Harris and he had alluded that it would uh, disenfranchise uh, residents and I believe that, as you said, to be false because all the feedback I've received is the opposite you know I mean it's not even necessarily convenient as we talked it's not convenient for me uh, to do it earlier so we're not just doing this for the council this really truly is the number of residents I've had say if I could come by you know 
if I could come by after work and drop into a meeting, I could make a comment, I could, I could be involved. I can't stop by because by the time I go home and I, I get dinner going and then it, it, it's all right, I'm into the evening, I've got to get the kids to bed, whatever it is. Um, so I'm, I've been very surprised by the amount of feedback that I've gotten just at how convenient this would be. And like you said, that it does line up with the uh, other municipalities. So I think it's a great move. Appreciate you bringing it to us. Thank you. Madam Mayor, I did have an individual at the city counter uh, stopping the hallway today and said that they are glad to see it possibly moving to six because they're, they have families and young kids and the meetings do tend to go, you know, if we have a big issue, two hours or two and a half hours, and at that point you're in nine, nine thirty at night and they have to get their kids to bed and it's just too late to be out during a weeknight. So that is a comment I did here in the office today. Thank you for sharing that. Any other comments, questions? It well, will not become, obviously, as the clerk said, excuse we have me, to... Excuse I'll come in. No, that's fine. I'm oh. just finishing what I'm saying. Oh, okay. And then you can. Um, if it is adopted to this evening, it won't become effective. It has to come back to us again at the next meeting, and then it will become effective in May. And please, yes, go ahead, Councilmember Ashford. Okay, yeah. Well, when we t first talked about it, I thought it was, you know, a good idea. And then I thought about, you know, how selfish I was being. You know, it was not so much about the time. I'm retired. And of course, I could do the six or the seven or whatever. But when I was working, I wouldn't even been able to come to a council meeting because I would just be getting to Port Heron about six o'clock. And um, I thought, how long have we had seven o'clock? Um, we've had seven o'clock for about probably 16, 17 years. It was 7.30 at one time. Mm -hmm. And then it was moved to seven o'clock oh, okay. about 17 years ago. Oh, okay. And so, so the bottom line reasoning is that we don't want want to be here too late. Is that what you're saying? No. Oh, what were you saying? That what point specific? What what what's the real reason? I mean, the reason. Really, I just because everyone voiced an opinion that they thought it would be a good thing to do, oh. and uh, I concur that I believe the people who have children, it's kind of hard for them to come to a meeting, stay for a couple hours, and get home and get their kids to bed, and mm -hmm. or even. You know, it's, it really is a choice of council. I mean, I really don't care one way or the other. I just think it's a, a, good, uh, a good thing to, to move it to six to be consistent with other municipalities and, and communities and gives us an opportunity, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. to, to be more. Yeah, diverse. I can see where, you, see where you're going with that. But uh, sometimes when you're having these kind of things, one size doesn't fit all, you know, in terms of go governmental bodies. Um, and what is a common denominator for me is that you think about people and they're all over, whether they have kids or they don't have kids, the timing, and it just seems like an area that they can work within, you know, not too too early and not too late, and the seven o'clock always seemed to fall in place. But like you said, this is the first reading, and, uh, and wherever you end up, I'll be here at the meeting, so. I just wanted to say yeah. that because, because honest, in all my interior, it's just you know I when you because you did ask me I said well that's fine it sounds fine you know but once you think about it in a problem solving term, um, for me it was being selfish because that that's about me but it's not about me it's about them. So thank you, Mayra. I think it's important too to point out that if another if there's a change in city council members. They have the opportunity to discuss and alter that time correct if they so choose so if someone were to want to run for city council and be elected and couldn't make a six o'clock they could bring it up and and uh if all of council chose to move it they could do so absolutely true yeah with all due respects the split flopping it just it's just you know, scratch mayor up I think the whole idea of this wasn't to appease the council. No. It was what the, the feedback and calls that. I, I, I'll say that I'm the one that actually had mentioned it to Mayor Rep a couple of weeks ago because of some of the feedback that I got and James nailed it with the kids. A lot of people would like to involve their young adults and maybe not kids, but you know, uh, middle school and high school kids in this and there just isn't time when they're getting home at 8, 9 o'clock at night. They didn't have time to grab dinner before, so they're trying to feed their kids at 9 o'clock at night. So it only seems like an hour, but for me, when I, I received several calls too, that people were appreciating that we were going to change that. It's not going to help everybody, and some people aren't going to like it, but the people that aren't able to make the 7 o'clock meetings will now get to 
take part and uh, see what it's about. So I support it. And yes, I, I guess we could just monitor attendance from here, and if the attendance goes up or down significantly, we could readdress it. It's an issue. So. Well, anything can be changed. Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, any other comments? We'll take the vote. Council Member Haremza? Yes. Council Member Lamb? Yes. Council Member Mojarek? Yes. Council Member Pemberton? Yes. Council Member Archibald? Yes. Council Member Ashford? No. Mayor Rep? Yes. We'll move on to item seven. Approving the decertification of 15 streets in accordance with Act 51 of 1951. Is there a motion? So moved. Support. Council Member Ashford, supported by Council Member Lamb and Mr. Freed. I think that this was yep. to the question in the audience. Yeah. Answer that, please. M Madam Mayor, we're talking in cumulative, uh, almost a mile of roadway across the entire city. We have several hundred miles of roadway. Whether it was a project of reconstructing the road or changing the intersection, these are sections of road that do not exist anymore. They simply do not exist. These roads don't exist. They will not change any services to any existing roads. These are essentially uh, working with our Act 51 map, which we have to certify with MDOT. MDOT has caught some, and then we did we caught some, and so we went through our entire map and tried to figure out which road sections of road no longer exist for whatever reason that could be, reconfigurations of intersections or whatever that could be. So you're dealing with roadway that simply doesn't exist, and we can't certify to get Act 51 funding for sections of roadway that don't exist. So it's less mm -hmm. than a mile cumulatively. Mm -hmm. It's a cleanup. It's a, yep. it's a housekeeping cleanup Sorry. measure. Anyone have any questions about that? We will take the vote. Council Member Lamb? Yes. Council Member Mosierak? Yes. Council Member Pemberton? Yes. Council Member Archibald? Yes. Council Member Ashford? Yes. Council Member Haremza? Yes. Mayor Rep? Yes. That concludes our agenda. Were you able to provide an update on the. Yeah. Yeah. Can you do that, please? Thank you. Um, is it Mr. Floss? Laws. 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 Okay, yeah. hi there. Thank you. Uh, thank you for teeing up because I did want to talk about this tonight. Um, so we have not bid out anything. There's no RFQ or project going on right now out there. So what we've here's where we're at right now. We're still assessing the damage and the possible solutions. So we intentionally left the debris in the canal to hold that canal gate down because the sand has been pushing up up to it, right? And so even though it dams off at Lake Huron. The body of the Santa hole pushes and pushes and pushes and we were afraid if we moved the debris and that gate moved it would allow sand down into the canal which would cause a greater problem so as we sent people out there to look at it we we're working with our engineering team we did engage an engineering team that does specifically this so today actually this morning uh, we had Raymond excavate was it Raymond or body? body body sorry body excavating out there um, they've done work on the armoring of the canal last season so they very intimate knowledge of that canal and the banks have eroded in such a way that we are actually worried about moving heavy equipment and trucks down. We put a little bit of riprap in there, not riprap, mill and fill uh, last year, just to prevent that from eroding when we were getting the dredging out. And so we just said get the debris out today so that we can take a further look at the, the, the Tainer Gate itself. Uh, we don't know how bent up it is, how broken it is. Uh, so we had to get the debris off, water's clearing up, the, the current has pretty much stopped. And so we're able to uh, better evaluate. So this is a, the further along the evaluation uh, right now. We did get a couple quotes on the debris removal. Uh, body was the best, and they had experience with the canal. What we anticipate is once we figure out what, what the actual plan of action is, then we'll develop uh, probably a design build uh, who can design that and build. It's going to have to require armory on both sides as well. Uh, the Tanner Gate is so old that it doesn't have welds. So it was before welding technology. It's all rivets. And so, yeah, so there's new technology. We do have a group of local folks who are, I call them, they're not engineers, but they're experts. Uh, they don't need a blueprint type of thing. Uh, so we do have a moonshot uh, project going on right now with some local guys that I give it about a 2% chance of succeeding. But I, I think we got to let the local guys give it a shot. So our engineering team has been interfacing with those locals uh, who are tra tradesmen who have a lot of experience with think Maybe they can take a whack at it. Uh, so I think in the next couple of weeks, you'll probably see the Tainer Gate, uh, which is 6,000 pounds. So getting a crane that can lift it um, and putting it on the side to further analyze it. And then the problem becomes once we remove the Tainer Gate, uh, you have sand moving in. So will there be a coffer dam? Uh, 
to the citizens of Port Huron that do not plan on that canal being open this summer. I mean, if it gets open mid-season, it'll be a miracle, but we have no illusions that this is going to be able to get wrapped up. We're working with the Army Corps and Eagle on getting emergency permits to build the coffer dam so that we can begin the restoration work, fixing it. We don't even know what that looks like yet. Um, the cost estimates we're getting right now are somewhere between half a million to 1.5 million. Uh, so we're going to have to figure out how we're going to pay for that. Um, that's a whole other conversation, but we're working to get it done as fast as possible. Um, if it looks like we're going slow, it's not. It's because there's a lot of technical uh, work that has to be done to keep people safe. Even today out there, having that large piece of equipment on the banks got a little a little sketchy at time. I think Councilmember Mojrak was out there, and it got pretty scary. Uh, the, the, you know, to make sure we do it safely, so it don't get hurt uh, pulling the debris out. So we are moving as quickly as possible. <clears throat> we're trying to think out of the box, uh, but hopefully we get something pretty quick. As for the odor control system, uh, we have a contract that will be on the meeting of the second meeting this month with Fishback to design a new five to eight million dollar odor control system. And we'll have a very big announcement to make about the the past odor control system. As you know, we installed an odor control system about two years ago, and it has failed. It clearly did not work. So we're working with former contractors. We do have something we'll announce hopefully in a week or so on the resolution to that issue. Uh, I think it'll be a, a real win for Port Huron. Uh, but we are working as fast as possible uh, so that we can do that and get it completed. Thank you. Also, to the FOIA requests, <laughs> to the to the budget transfers, hey. you requested that information when I was out of the town, I was out of the state, um, and you filed a FOIA request before I returned from vacation. Once you file a FOIA request, we have to go through the legal FOIA procedure. So you'll have to get through the FOIA procedure rather than wait until you get back from vacation. Sorry about that. Yes, is there anything else for <laughs> uh, Yeah, Madam Mayor. Actually, a, a, a couple things. One, um, on the canal update, when you said the moonshot was 2%, that was a 2% moonshot of trying to do it without damming off the canal. Is that what you're saying? Or no? I just, just, just. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's some people who think it could be fixed. Yep. Uh, the concrete superstructure, we need the valley that's possible and what it would actually take. I don't know what that looks like. I just want want the public to know that yeah. we are not we're not relying on engineers. I know so. Yeah. You bring an engineering team in and they bureaucratic everything up and what should have been s simple as so. <laughs> yeah. So we're working on that too. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, that that was uh, my next question. Just the update, as they said, as we're rolling into the spring and summer, that it we do have a, a better announcement and plan hopefully for this summer versus last. Correct. Yeah, we gave the PowerPoint. And I joke around, not, I just don't think there's a couple hundred boaters out there watching the PowerPoint. So I think when they get up to the canal, they can't get through. That's when we're going to start hearing from them. Um, and so <laughs> yeah. I'm dreading that day. So I'm trying to be very proactive, let people know, like, this, the Tainer Gate is much more serious condition, a larger issue than I think people fully understand. It's not as simple as just put, lift it back up and bolt it in the place. There's, there's damage rods on top. The lifting mechanism itself is bit damaged and bent. The bearings are having issues now. So it's pretty complex. Actually, it was about the water plant. So the water plant will be in better shape yes. this year. The wastewater plant. Yes. That. Yes. Wastewater. And then the last one, just to repeat, if I still have time. Yes, you uh, do. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the audio and, and visual stuff, what's the latest? Update? The installation is tomorrow morning. Thank you. And the audio that wasn't working last meeting, and I think probably this meeting, is on the Comcast side of things. It was not us. It was Comcast. Didn't push it. Great. I just wanted for people at home to know that we're it's still coming yes. soon yep and remember if the audio doesn't work on comcast it we do put up on youtube great thank you that's it that's it anyone else have anything anyone down this end have anything real quick uh, the wastewater plant you said this coming year yeah <laughs> okay so we have developed so i, I want to be very I hey. curb your enthusiasm but um we're going to have to design and build a five to eight million dollar system that's going to require air scrubbers, charcoal scrubbers. It's going to be much larger. To handle the odor that this, the ammonia levels that our plant puts off is going to be pretty significant. So we actually anticipate that this is going to probably be a two to three year project. In the meantime, our staff internally have begun working on a odor uh, remediation plan using vinegar. And it seems to be doing pretty good, actually. Um, we've also in, uh, updated our controls on when we will open the doors, when we'll fill the trucks to mitigate any foul smell downtown. So most people who are downtown often have noted a, a marked improvement in the odor from downtown. But it's a significant challenge. It's, it's going to be an engineering marvel to, to make this proprietary device for our, for our city. But we will get it done. 
Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have anything to bring to council? <laughs> and I will out. <laughs> I will entertain a motion to adjourn, please. So move, Madam Chair. Meeting adjourned. Yep. Yeah.